We are the Childhood Collective, and we have helped thousands of overwhelmed parents find joy and confidence in raising their child with ADHD. I'm Katie, a speech-language pathologist. And I'm Lori. And I'm Mallory, and we're both child psychologists. We combine the science of ADHD with the compassion of moms and bring you practical tools you can start using today. So hit subscribe and let's help your family shine with ADHD. Today we are talking about something that is incredibly important to us as parents and a question I ask myself a lot actually, and that is how can I build my child's confidence? So if you are raising a child or more than one child with ADHD, you've probably heard them talk negatively about themselves, and it can really break your heart. We know from the research that kids with ADHD tend to have lower self-esteem than their peers. The truth is they get so many more corrections and instructions than kids who don't have ADHD, and this can really impact how they see themselves. That's so true. And Today's episode is going to be a little bit shorter than most because we want to talk about one very specific thing that we can do as parents to help grow confidence in kids with ADHD. So are you ready for it? It sounds We're ready. It sounds really <laughs> simple, but it takes some intentionality. Here it is. Encourage your child to follow what they naturally love to do. That's it. Encourage your child to follow what they naturally love to do. I love this. This topic gets me really excited. We spend so much time teaching our kids new skills and helping them grow in areas where they struggle. Maybe it's teaching them new routines, giving them tools to support their executive functioning and supporting them in social situations. But this idea to lean into the things that they're already good at I love it. I really do. And if you talk to successful adults with ADHD, this is often a huge part of their story. Like they found work that just lights them up and it makes them feel fulfilled and excited at work. And the truth is it's not always perfectly straightforward to find out what your child loves to do. And each of us is on a journey with our own kids as (laughs) we all kind of try to figure this out. So today we just wanted to share with you a few common questions that come up when we talk about this topic. Yep. So one of the first questions that parents often ask us is how do I know what my child already enjoys? Um, And some of you have kids who really have shown a passion and an interest in a particular area. And so, you know, it, they can naturally show you like, this is something that I love to do. I know I have, um, you know, a nephew that is super into Legos and he is always, you know, building and doing those types of things. And that has always been an interest for a really long time and his passion. Um, I know, you know, again, for my kids, Finding their passion has been a journey. Um, and again, I don't know that we've necessarily like reached that of figuring out that. what they want to do. Um, I'm sure you guys can relate too. But part of it is giving them a lot of different opportunities to find out what they really have a passion for. Um, I know for many families, it can be frustrating for um kids with ADHD, they often are really passionate about something, but then like, uh, you know, after you spend thousands of dollars on uh, a team and equipment and all this stuff, then six months later or even sooner, they're like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go. And then that's a really frustrating (laughs) experience. Mm -hmm. The passion fizzles. Yeah. (laughs) The passion fizzles. Um, so you know, sometimes it it can be really hard to figure those things out. But even just think about starting small. This doesn't have to be going out and spending those thousands of dollars on something or the best coach for your child or things like that. It's just maybe we get a baseball and a glove and we play catch after school and see if you're interested in that. Um, I know my husband is super into soccer and so we we didn't sign our kids up for soccer until we got like a net in our backyard and a soccer ball and he like kicked it around with them and was doing that to to the point where like 
you know, at least one of our kids, they're both doing it right now. One is not showing passion and one is. Um, <laughs> but one of them really took to it. You know, she like thought it was super fun and really enjoyed it. One of them goes in and out of it. Um, right. So we're kind of trying to figure that out also. Absolutely. Um, and I feel like the other thing about soccer is actually the gear is pretty affordable. Same with basketball. Yes. Like you just need a basketball and a hoop, um, which the hoop can be a little bit of an investment, but I don't know. My son is trying to play baseball and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is so many things that you need to buy for like yes. a very simple little league team. So I guess <laughs> yes. as you're thinking about trying out different things, that can be something to keep in mind. Like soccer is a good starting point because all you really need is a ball and maybe yeah. a net. Yeah. My kids, speaking of expensive things, my kids started ice skating and after they started ice skating, I was told that that was the most expensive sport you could possibly do. But and Lori, I'm like, you awesome. Horseback riding, right? And I feel like I, well, horseback riding. So I also... said, actually horseback riding might top the ice skating. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'll find out. Both of my, my kids really want to do both. So we might be doing that <laughs> at some point. Um, but certainly owning a horse is an extreme expense. Um, but there are also other things that you can do to kind of figure out what your kid's passion is. But speaking of ice skating, my kids were in a competition and actually their friends came to watch. And one of them just from watching, you know, like a competition, their kids were like, wow, that looks like so much fun. And so then they signed up for classes. And it's mm -hmm. there are so many different activities out there that you have no idea where your child might be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, another really awesome thing to do, and I know like in our city, we have um, through the city of Scottsdale, they offer all kinds of low cost um, classes for kids, adults, um, you know, infants, like, it, you know, a wide variety of things. And if your child really isn't into sports and that's not their thing, they have art related classes and um, music classes and things like that. So that's another area that you can look into that's not going to be super expensive for your child to maybe try out a variety of mm -hmm. different things. Um, mm -hmm. But if they aren't super excited and you've tried different things, don't lose hope. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, they're, they maybe just haven't found that thing that they are super interested in. Um, mm -hmm. and if they kind of give up on something really quickly, sometimes as parents, we have to maybe think about, is this something, you know, we want them to kind of quit on, or is it maybe just a funk? Like I know when I did horseback riding, like I would go through periods where I loved it and I was passionate about it. And I went through periods where, you know, it was hard, you know, it could be hard when you're learning a new skill within that sport, you know, when Absolutely. you're learning how to go from, you know, galloping the horse to jumping your first jump, that can be scary and that can bring up some fear and that can mm -hmm. make your child maybe back off and thinking about how do we kind of support our child through that as opposed to just maybe like quitting and doing something else. Um, so mm -hmm. those are things that we have to kind of help our kids through. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So our first point here is figuring out how do I know what my child enjoys? And if they haven't found it yet, those are a bunch of different ideas to help you kind of start to feel it out and figure it out. And I think that um, definitely keeping in mind that ADHD piece when you're considering this, because as Lori mentioned, sometimes that motivation can ebb and flow. And we're also going to talk about quitting um, in just a few minutes here. But um, Mal, what do we do if your child, um, a lot of people listening are probably thinking like, my kid loves video games and that's mostly it. So what, what can we say to those families who are like, yep, we have one interest and that's what it is. Yeah. And I think that's a question that we hear a lot. And it's not surprising to us because video game screens are very stimulating and very motivating to the ADHD brain. They're giving constant, continuous feedback and reinforcement. They're constantly changing, very stimulating. So a lot of kids with ADHD do find themselves loving video games. And video games are big in my house. And if you're a lot of a lot of what this comes down to is your child's executive functioning, and um, the ADHD brain really craves that um, immediate feedback 
and those, you know, continuous hits of dopamine. And if you're, if you're like executive functioning, what's that? Uh, we have past episode on it, but we also have a free guide, our six keys to raising a confident and independent child with ADHD. Blah. That's not the name of it. It is, Sorry, right? guys. No, it's not <laughs> confident and independent. It's happy and independent. Got it. Okay. If you're wanting to learn more about executive functioning, we have a past podcast episode you can listen to. We also have a free guide, a free parenting guide, six keys to raising a happy and independent child with ADHD. We'll put the link to that um, in the show notes, but that's a great place to learn more about how your child's brain is working, why it works the way it does. Um, But kind of thinking, how do we address this common challenge that families are experiencing where their child's passion is video games. And I want to be really careful here. I don't want to demonize video games. I don't want to demonize screens. I think that they can and do play a very important part um, in our child's lives. And I don't even want to have a of the mind frame of video games are taking away from other really important things because video games are valid and can and do play an important part. But something that I personally see in my own home is when we don't have a limit to screens or video games, doing anything else is like a response cost to them. They see an opportunity lost to play video Mm -hmm. games. So I could be outside or is the other option video games? Oh, I could go practice riding my bike at the park, but is the other option video games? Um, (sighs) And it's really easy to get kind of sucked into that cycle quickly where everything your child is doing, they're weighing like, I could do that or I could play video games. So having very clear limits around screen use will help you out. So for example, if your child gets two hours of video games a day, let's say, that doesn't change whether your child is sitting at home with free time or they're out playing soccer, pursuing another passion. It's always going to be two hours. Um, so there's not that kind of weighing in their mind of like, oh, but could I be doing video games instead? Um, so having very clear limits around video games, making sure that your child has ample opportunities to do other things, um, explore other passions, kind of like what Lori talked about. Um And sometimes (laughs) your child may experience kind of this like paralysis, but what do I do instead? They might need a little help from you um, to brainstorm lists of ideas of other things that they could do outside of video games. So make sure that there's lots of other options available to them of things that they can do and filling their time with. um, So they kind of get these varied experiences, trying new things trying to find that passion and following that passion. Um, And I think to speak to that, I think I see a lot of families almost like over parenting and overcompensating in those situations where mm -hmm. they feel like it's their job to like make sure that their kids are entertained all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes within that boredom, where they're not entertained and there isn't anything to do is when they become the most creative or think, I know my kids, like if I don't have anything for them to do, sometimes I find like they have, one of my kids will get an idea and they're outside and they're creating like a swing outside on the, Mm -hmm. you know, tree or whatever. And they never would have done that otherwise. So I think sometimes we kind of over, do things for our kids and that, and sitting in that boredom can be okay. For sure. And for every family, it's like finding the balance, you know, because some kids are going to be like, I know for myself, if I'm turning the TV off, I will really, my kids will have that moment. Like Mallory's talking about where they're like, but what do I do? And it's almost like this paralysis. And if I just walk away and say like, figure it out, they're going to struggle. But if I sit down with them and, and kind of just help them problem solve for a few minutes, then they're much better at figuring out how to play independently. For us, it's really the transition that's tricky. Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. like, I'm not there, like I'm the cruise director for the next two hours of free play, but <laughs> they do need some kind of boundaries and suggestions in order to be successful. So I think that this is so personal and each 
child, like amongst the three of us, we have six different kids with six different skill sets for free yeah. play, but recognizing your child and your family, like what is the level of support that they require to be mm-hmm. successful? And knowing that if it's not smooth the first time, that's okay. Like that's not shocking. That's absolutely normal. And that doesn't mean it didn't work. That just means we might need to tweak the plan a little bit. Yep. Absolutely. And I think, I think as parents too, if you find yourself in a position where your child's passion is video games, um, you can find ways to kind of lean into the tech piece and lean into that passion. So if your child is really interested in video games, enrolling them in a class um, that teaches them about video game development, where they learn how to code. Mm-hmm. Or I know at my boys' school, they offer a Lego Minecraft club. So yeah. for kids who are super into Minecraft, kids who are super into Lego, it's kind of like meshing those worlds of um, kind of video game, and, but then also like using my hands, building things, being creative. And, yeah. and Minecraft is in itself a very creative game. Um, but, you know, getting creative and figuring out how can you – leverage your child's interests in video games and give them like other opportunities that are related to that and grow other skills that you find really important. I love it. So point number two is for those kids who are really, really focused on their video games. One, we want to normalize that. That's something we see all the time, but you kind of have a couple different things you can try and it doesn't have to be all or nothing, right? You can help them by setting hard limits and then helping them with doing other things during that time or, and, or you can lean into that tech and really help them figure out how to expand that interest a little bit beyond just playing video games by themselves. Mm -hmm. So our third question or thing that comes up a lot is, and Lori touched on this already is what about when my child just wants to quit something that they've started? Mm -hmm. And I think there's so much nuance. And so we really hesitate to give like hard and fast advice, because in every situation, there's going to be pieces that we aren't obviously understanding. But um, I think Lori had a really good point, And that is that there is this kind of up and down to interest in ADHD. Something new is more interesting. Therefore, I can attend to it more easily. Something unique, something that really aligns with my passions. And so I think that as parents, we have to really use a judgment call on this. And if your child is super gifted in a certain area and you know that this has been something they've really like cared about and loved, but they're just struggling because it's newer, like a new level and it's hard, then that's one situation. And on the other hand, it may not be the most popular opinion at the table, but I'm not really opposed to letting kids quit in certain contexts. And I don't know, what do you, what do you girls think? Is that, is that so off base? (laughs) No, that's not so off base. I know it's funny because Katie, I feel like we've talked before with our own kids of like problem solving. How do we do this? So we're not giving advice here because we like ask each other all the time. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, I know my kids were doing gymnastics for a while and then they were like wanted to switch. And I feel like they're really at an age where I want them to try different things still. And I'm fine with that, but they've sort of lost a little bit of interest in ice skating. And I do feel like it's more because it's not the new super exciting thing. And maybe it's becoming a little bit challenging in some ways. So I want them to keep doing that and they're not super resistant to it either. Um, right. but again, if you're seeing your child, like hating it and, and it's like a pain and, Um, They're sort of constantly getting corrective feedback from the coach. Maybe it isn't the best situation for them. Maybe you do need Mm -hmm. to look for something different and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think the key here is that we really want to be curious. And I think so much of parenting is getting curious um, and really kind of sitting down with your child and talking through it. Like, why do you want to quit? Like, tell us more about that because you're going to get to the heart of it. Like, oh, it's just because I'm trying to get, like my daughter is a gymnast and when she's at a new level and she's doing something really hard, she's really excited to do that hard thing, right? So, but in my son might feel differently about certain things. And if it's really, really challenging, he might say like, I just need a break. And so we want to see like, what's the, really what's the why behind it? And that helps Mm -hmm. you start to figure out how to best approach it. And I know that for my son, he's six and he, is just like forever has been like, I want to play baseball, as I mentioned, and he loves baseball. And then my son, my husband is a basketball player 
player and a basketball coach, and he coached my son's basketball team um, just the last few months. And now we have, he decided to do another season of basketball. And my son is enrolling in baseball for the first time. And it's just kind of like a conversation because we have a lot going on. And I don't know that we can keep going with two different things. We kind of found out the games overlap. And so we're having this conversation. And I think that, you know, my son is six years old which seems really young, but he has a lot of strong ideas. And so really at the end of the day, what we're encouraging you to do is exactly what I'm doing in my own home, which is to sit down and say, which one are you enjoying? What's your preference? And, and then kind of going from there. So just as parents, don't be scared to kind of let go of your own idea of what your kid is going to be into. Um, and really just listening to them and figuring out what they are interested in and keeping in mind that quitting isn't always a bad thing. It can also help you make room for something else. Like Mm -hmm. in Lori's example, they had to quit gymnastics to then do ice skating and they wouldn't have found that passion if they wouldn't have been able to quit gymnastics. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So our key takeaway today on our short mini episode, which we're so glad you guys are here is to help build your child's confidence. You want to help them find something they love and follow it. And as you figure that out, we are here to help support you. Thanks for listening to Shining with ADHD by your hosts, Lori, Katie, and Mallory of the Childhood Collective. If you enjoyed this episode, please like this video and hit subscribe so you can be the first to know when a new episode airs. If you are looking for links and resources mentioned in this episode, you can always find those in the show notes. See you next time.